Good morning. Good morning once again. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Hey, thanks for joining. Good to see you. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, had a good time in church day out. Missed seeing us, some of y'all. But, uh, but good, good. Okay, so we've been going through this subject of the local church. Uh, we've come uh, covered quite a bit. We've completed the actual meat of this uh, topic, the second section, the God's Blueprint. Section one and section two, it's it's like 90% uh, of it. <laughs> You're scared, Sri Radha. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, we just started the class and things are about falling down. <laughs> so I don't know what's up with this class and things falling down. So it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's the anointing or if it's just sleep. <laughs> it's, uh, but anyways, so we've covered section one, section two. Um, section three, we'll just cover a couple of chapters, but the remainder of the sections will be covered in your other subjects. So what I, Today will most likely be the last class um, of this subject. Yeah, because other subjects, yeah. Uh, so the other chapters of this book, you're talking like you're going to miss me, dude. But, <laughs> but uh, the other subjects, sorry, chapters will be covered in subjects such as uh, in your final year on church and ministry administration and uh, church, uh, urban church planting, etc. Okay, so it will be covered in all the other subjects. In, next year so right all good yeah okay awesome all right let's start off with section three and uh, chapter 19 page 181 in your hard copy and 123 in your soft copy <clears throat> Section three is uh, titled Divine Order, and um, chapter 19 is titled Sacraments of the Church. Um, so what's a sacrament? So sacrament, okay, basically, uh, I think it's too early to ask, start asking questions. <laughs> the sacraments or ordinances simply means practices. That's it, okay. Sac um, or in other words, a divine practices or holy practices, as we would call it. Uh, it's and again, we get those words from uh, the Greeks and the Latins uh, and all of that. So, sacraments or ordinance of the church, we refer to the practices uh, ordained by Christ, permanently observed by the church. So, practices. Yeah, chapter 19, Sacraments of the Church. Oh, good Lord. Anything more? <laughs> Last class, guys. Last day. <laughs> Just try and bear with me. Okay. See, Ravali is also here. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So there are two practices that Jesus, uh, you know, uh, made show sure that it's been followed uh, for a long time, permanently at least, as a practice. So one of the practices uh, that is actually survived for all these years is uh, water baptism, right? Um, now, baptism in itself, uh, so what does baptism mean? Immerse. Immerse, all right? It's again, comes from a Latin word called baptizio, means uh, immersed into or being brought into. That's what it is being brought into. So, in when we read in Matthew twenty-eight verse nineteen, or I think nineteen, uh, so go, uh, you know, preach the gospel, baptizing them. Yes, it 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 is talking about that, but in in other words, in larger perspective, it's talking about bring them in. Okay, bring uh, all the other people into the kingdom of God, into our family. So that's what it, it really means. So, um, so what a baptism. Let's look at that a little bit. Um, is it important? Is it not important? 
So these ordinances or practices uh, or sacraments are practiced by every believer, also means by which the power of Christ's finished, cross, finished work on the cross becomes real and effective. So let's learn a little bit about water baptism. As, uh, there's a lot of points uh, in your textbook. Let's go one by one. <clears throat> How many of you remember the day you were baptized? Wait, everybody, is everybody water baptized? <laughs> I'm just, okay. <clears throat> Um, do you remember the day, when, where? Where? Garden River, right? Date, okay. So, which place? Gypsy. Gypsy Federation. Okay. How old okay. Which year? 2015. 2015, you know? Answer. Wow. Okay. Okay, Alan, are you busy? Okay, okay. Don't worry about that. You're ten years old. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, as okay. Nickel. Monday, eighteenth December, two thousand fifteen. Come on, talk about the details, dude. Awesome. Two thousand eighteen. All right. Sri Rada. Awesome. Two thousand nineteen. Okay. Love, love. Okay. Yeah, 2020. Oh, in Kerala, wow, in the beach, all exotic locations only. It's you know, <laughs> destination baptism, it's like destination wedding. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, it's awesome. I think something beautiful about it, uh, you know. So, uh, let's look at what uh, some of the points mentioned in the notes and what the scriptures have to say about it parallelly. Uh, and uh, keep your Bible handy, or if you have any software that you can flip, go to the books faster, is also fine. So, introduced by John the Baptist uh, when announcing the kingdom of heaven on earth as a sign of repentance. Right? So, we, uh, it's one of the reasons why we call him John the, the Baptist, is because you kind of introduced this whole thing of. Um, so, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, we'll read about that. Um, so, what was uh, John the Baptist's famous message? Right, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was his message, and it was followed by the action of baptism. And so, uh, one of the expressions of uh, repenting, uh, which was introduced by John back then was baptizing. That means you're confessing or you're expressing, uh, saying, okay, I'm dying to myself. So I repent of uh, and I die to my old self and I want to be born again. I want to be a new creation, right? Um, and, so, and so that was a very important ex expression of faith. So we see that we read about that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. And, uh, and a lot of significant things happen. And we know that Jesus goes to him to get baptized, right? Um, and uh, he he gets to introduce jesus to the world like um after the after the you know after he was born and all the advent things he says behold he actually introduces or not inter introduces but he talks about him twice so first first time when he looks at him i'm sure they've had conversations before that they're cousins okay so <laughs> uh but when he comes he says behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world, all right? That's very important to notice because uh, until then, everything that was practiced in the tabernacle, uh, you know, priests pouring the blood over the mercy seat, it's a covering. It's a covering of, you know, on the mercy seat. Like, so the sins are covered, uh, but it's not taken. That's why they had to keep doing that. Right, they had to follow the practice. But when we read about it in Hebrews, Hebrews nine and Hebrews ten, we see that Jesus, he with his, you know, by his own blood, once and for all, paid for all sins. Right. So John notices that, and he take, he says, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." So he's having this revelation, this incredible revelation, and then it's like, and he and he starts walking towards him. Okay, and then that's also fine. And then he says, okay, now baptize me. I can only imagine John the Baptist's mind voice, you know, because like, what are you talking about? You know, and then he says that, you know, I have to be baptized by you. Why are you, you know, 
why are you asking coming to me to be baptized? But it's uh, so let's look at that. Second point says so Jesus was baptized, although he had nothing to repent from to demonstrate obedience to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, so let's quickly read that scripture, shall we? Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to uh, 16. So it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan. Uh, to John to be baptized by him. Okay, John would have uh, prevented. John would have prevented him saying, "I need to be baptized by you." And do you come to me? I'm reading from the ESV version, just so you know. Uh, but Jesus answered him, "Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness." So uh, it, it's a it's a very classic question, and if you've have the, had this question. Uh, but why did Jesus have to be baptized? <clears throat> right? And I'm sure at some point or uh, some stage in life we would have asked that question. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? Uh, you know, I'm a sinner, so I get baptized. I want to repent of my sins. I want to die to my old self and whatnot. But it says, so in verse 15, he's saying, uh, let's do this so all righteousness is fulfilled. Now, this is one of the steps in fulfilling all righteousness, which was finished. On the cross but this was very important just like he identified with mankind with his birth uh, you know and uh, and so this was another way of Jesus identifying himself with mankind with the sinful nature of the mankind are you with me right <clears throat> so Jesus was baptized though he had nothing to repent <clears throat> Uh, to demonstrate obedience and fulfill uh, uh, to fulfill all righteousness uh, again so when we say that he was identifying with the mankind what was he doing jesus was sinless isn't it he was he's a spotless blameless bl a lamb without blemish isn't it <clears throat> but in identifying he was repenting on our behalf he's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world isn't it right he was asking for forgiveness for the sins that he did not commit are you with me? And so in that, he's recognizing, he's identifying himself with us. Why? Because he's the Lamb of God. Uh, if you read through the book of Leviticus, um, Leviticus, in other words, in a modern uh, way, it's a title simply means it's a manual, uh, it's a manual for the priests, basically. It was a, like, we have a manual, no? Like for how to use this gadget, how to fix this thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Driver's manual, uh, user's manual, etc. So Levit the book of Leviticus is a uh, a manual for the priests. Um, so and it's very important for us to go through that book. Uh, just please don't ignore that book whenever you can read it. Uh, one of the ways in how the sins were transferred from a perpetrator or a person who committed a sin was that he would again. We all know the story. We be uh, he would bring uh, an innocent lamb, isn't it? A spotless lamb. He would keep his hand on the head of the lamb. And in doing so, the, the sins are transferred. Okay? There are many ways. So either the lamb was slain or that lamb was sent into the wilderness alone. Like just, yes, like a scapegoat. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of significance to uh, baptism. Or right, let's go on. I don't want to dwell on this for too long. Um, Third point says baptism is a command in the New Testament, uh, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, which we just uh, saw that. Okay, it's a commandment, so baptizing them. Okay, actually, let's read that. Matthew twenty-eight, Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen and twenty. When the Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared. Matthew twenty-eight. Yeah. Even to the end of the age. Yeah, thank you. So it's a commandment, right? It's called the Great Commission. Um, and, and it's one of, uh, it's not a suggestion, right? It's a commandment. He's not suggesting, you know, what do you think? Right, so it says, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That means bringing them in, right? In the name of the Father, 
Um, so this is Jesus' commandment. Look, it says, in the name of the Father. So do all this in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, one of the things, when you go through the book of Acts, every time you know it talks about baptism, uh, be ba being baptized in the Holy Spirit or water baptism and whatnot, it says they were baptized in the name of Jesus. It was, they were all baptized in the name of Jesus. So, and they followed these commandments. That means if for them to follow thousands of people, and you know, a few years later, that means it was taught. You with me? And so it was taught and it was followed. Okay. Uh, baptism expresses your decision to follow Jesus Christ alone. And point five says baptism is a symbol of the inner experience of death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus. Now we're going to read a bunch of scriptures. Um, yeah. No. So if, is there a difference in baptizing someone in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit versus just in the name of Jesus? Okay, so I don't think so. Good. Jehovah's Witness will point this out because uh, they don't believe in Jesus as a God. They only believe, uh, they only witness, yeah. It's the only thing that Jesus is a son of God, but he is not God. But we understand Trinity in a way that, okay, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all co-equals. Yeah, three in one. Uh, and so, I mean, how many scriptures do we need to read in the book of uh, Gospel of John to say that, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And why, why did it offend a lot of Jews? Uh, is because he made statements that was very uh, provocative in a way that they wanted to kill him, right? They wanted to stone him to death. They wanted to push him off the cliff. Why? Because he he made statements uh, saying he doesn't necessarily didn't say you know uh, some of uh, say our Muslim friends what they do is they ask tell me show me where in the Bible Jesus says he is God. They want those three literal words I am God. Uh, worship me. Right, but you you can call someone uh, wonderful without using the word wonderful, right? Or you can call someone amazing by using other words, isn't it? You can also call someone stupid by not using the word stupid. You get what I'm saying, right? Uh, but it, it was the language of the era back then. Um, it, now another thing is called the biblical all alliterations is. Uh, now, when Jesus quoted a verse, he was he was actually referring to the verses before that and after that, and so he was functioning. And because he knew, see, the Jewish audience, right? The kids were put in school from the age of two, and by the time that they are age ten, they would know the entire Tanakh, that is, the Old Testament, by heart. By heart. Okay, uh, and so uh, what was it, it's not so it's not uh, surprising that Jesus knew the Bible by heart by the age of twelve, you know, as a kid. But it was in the wisdom that he was functioning or reciting those things and putting it in context that amazed everybody else. So my point here is, Jesus, when he was referring to a certain verse, he expected his audience to be at a certain level to know the verse before and after. Right? And surprisingly, they knew. And that's why they were offended. Okay, I know you're saying that verse, but I know what is before and after that verse. Isn't it? And so uh, they were just functioning at a different level of a level of intellectual uh, you know, uh, wisdom, I should say. So it's the same, in other words. Um, so there's no much difference. OK. Uh, baptism is an expression, point six, of your desire to maintain clear conscience before God. Let's read First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. It says, was, oh, okay, First Peter chapter 3, verse 21, read. And the water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a 
clean conscience it is effective because of the resurrection of jesus christ yeah awesome thank you it is effective because of the resurrection of jesus christ now the very la okay let's read one more scripture the very last verse of romans chapter 4 can somebody read i think it's verse 24 um, romans 24 25. 25 okay yeah Verse twenty five. Who was delivered? Uh, uh, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification? And raised for our Justi justification. So that means we were not justified until he was raised. And because of his resurrection, we are now justified. And because of his resurrection, baptism has meaning. All right. Okay, so now let's go back to first Peter chapter 3, verse 21. So let's read through that. Okay. Baptism, which corresponds, I'm again reading from ESV, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. Now it's dipping into water is not just to cleanse yourself from external uh, you know, uh, dirt or being clean externally. Now, this was this was kind of practiced in, in a way. Uh, like he's also referring to the priests that followed this practice in the old testament. Right in the tabernacle and in the temple, that before they entered the uh, the holy place, that is the inner courts, the priests, after offering the, uh, sacrifices in the altar of sacrifice, they would go to the bronze laver, which was filled with water on the inside. Yes, and they would wash their hands and their feet before going entering the um, the inner courts the, or the holy place. Uh, and so, it's kind of saying, okay, it's not just about cleansing yourself from the outside. It's not just that. Uh, it says when you die to yourself, you know, your conscience is also cleansed. Okay, so there's so many scriptures that I want us to go through uh, as like a cross-reference, so to speak. Um, let's be a little quick with this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Awesome. Thank you. So having buried, been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful uh, working of God, who raised him from the dead. Okay, some more. Acts 2.38, maybe. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I, if you want to make a note of some of the scriptures that I want to uh, give, you can make a note of it. This and because for time's sake, I'll just uh, so you can read Acts twenty-two verse sixteen. Acts 22, verse 16, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 6. It's a classic chapter that, Romans chapter 6. It's talking about how we were dead and how, yeah, chapter 6, verse 3 to 6. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 and finally Titus chapter 3 verse 5 to 7 Titus chapter 3 verse 5 to 7 now there are a lot more cross references that talks about baptism but I uh, I think it's I'm giving all of this uh, so that you can also save and have like a, um, you know, a list of scriptures which is related to baptism. It will come in handy. I'm, this is again talking with regards to as leaders and as pastors. When it, anything regarding this subject, you can always go back to this uh, scriptures. Okay. All right. Baptism is an expression of your desire to maintain a clear conscience um, before God, and the only requirement to be baptized is repent and believe repent and believe um so you remember the scripture romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 romans 10 verse 9 and 10 
um, the amount, and then he, yeah, okay. So that's what it says. Romans chapter ten, verse nine and ten. Um, that's what it calls out for. If you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth, okay. So baptism is an immersion. Uh, is, is by immersion in water only. Uh, now again, this this topic, this that particular point, right, is up for discussion because uh, the original idea of baptism is immersion in water. What can be the exceptions? So you're a pastor, right? You're a pastor of a church, but a person is disabled, can't really be immersed into the water, but wants to be baptized. So then normal person comes, Rin comes. I said, like, I don't like water, uh, so what will you do? It's like choke slam. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why we have a teaching lessons, right? Before any, anyone who signs up, even at APC, wants to get baptized, uh, we have a, like say, a half an hour class that someone takes. Say, this is what baptism is. Uh, and so and most of them who come, come with a certain understanding. But we need to be ready with uh, accept, uh, scenarios or situations or circumstances and, and consider exceptions accordingly. Be wise in those decisions. Understood? So you can't say, okay, the Bible, this is what it says, it only means immersion, so I don't care if you're on an oxygen cylinder, I'm going to immerse you. <laughs> uh, right? So that's just being uh, unwise, to say it politely. So. Okay, so you do not have to become very holy to be baptized. People were baptized as soon as they repented and believed in Jesus Christ. Um, so baptism was not for holy people. Or at least who thought they were holy, right? Uh, okay, water baptism will not make you a spiritual giant. You, <laughs> you still must grow spiritually through the word and prayer. Okay. Um, the, in the beginning of the class, the reason I asked a uh, question, if you remember, the day when you were baptized is because I remember the day I was baptized and how I would feel. I thought, okay, I was something else. Superhero, like okay, titanium. Okay, that's like the song, uh, you know. <laughs> Instruction has been removed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it doesn't mean you just because you get baptized and come, you you are, you are now a supernatural being. You you still have to walk this walk of life. Run, run this race, keep the faith. Uh, that means you have to grow in maturity, grow in spiritual maturity, uh, grow in strength, uh, with the, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, please remember that. I, and I know all. You, it's like I'm preaching to the choir or teaching to the choir. You guys know all of this, but it is important for us to communicate, be able to communicate all of this to any individuals who might have certain questions. Right? The, all these points are so very fundamental. That's why they are fundamental. Okay, uh, water baptism will not make you a spiritual giant. Uh, because baptism is an act of obedience, you can expect increased measure of blessing. Um, because baptism, now, baptism is an act of obedience. Now, uh, when we get baptized, we are doing what? Like Romans chapter six, what it says, we are we are experiencing the. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So that means it has some meaning to it, obviously. Right? And you are saying, Lord, I want to be obedient and I want to, you know, uh, come before you and say, I'm dying to my old self. And I believe that I'm, I'm a new creation in you. With that comes every benefit of the kingdom. Isn't it? Okay. Um, because baptism is a symbol, last point, because baptism is a symbolic proclamation of the cross, you can expect the power of the cross to affect your life in breaking bondages, addictions, bringing deliverance, and more during baptism. It, it, see, again, just coming back to the previous point, it's about what it signifies. It's, it doesn't matter if you get baptized uh, in the in the river or in the water tank or in the in in the ocean or even river Jordan like you know 
you know i want to go to the holy land you know <laughs> uh said so it, it's not about the what okay it, it, it's about what it signifies right uh, and and that sets us free it makes us a new creation because we come in agreement with with the kingdom of god with with the king himself with everything that he did for us okay so it's not really about just to say that okay now i'm baptized i can uh i'm a new creation or uh whatever no it, it's just everything that is part of the kingdom is is for us now and that is the importance of uh, you know we are talking about the sacraments and and uh, practices isn't it uh of the church and so this is not just uh baptism for the sake of uh following the practice but everything else that's part of it and just to reiterate the point before we move on to the next thing it says uh, in the book of acts if you go through the early church uh, every it says uh they were all baptized in the name of in the name of jesus right okay uh, the classic example i i always like to take is uh acts chapter 9 verse 15 uh ananias he goes to meet paul but before he goes to meet paul uh he's very hesitant he's saying this lord uh, god says ananias go and meet paul anoint him uh but what is ananias uh, initial response is okay. yeah you don't know what he has done he's killed people why should i go i'm scared i'm afraid etc cetera, etc cetera. you remember that story right acts chapter 9 verse 15 but what jesus says uh you know is that he is a chosen vessel uh, i've chosen him to carry my name excuse me <laughs> excuse me i have chosen him to carry um, my name right and uh, i've mentioned this before every brand on this planet earth uh, wants you to carry their name right uh, i can't see i can't can't see any name <laughs> like from hp to dell and to apple and samsung and uh, what, whatever the brand, right? Nike, Adidas, Reebok. Uh, why do they have uh, um, endorsements? Is because they want a certain individual to carry their name. And so, if, if a certain individual, if Roger Federer wears a Nike bandana, every kid is want to going to you know wanting to buy a Nike bandana. If Sachin Tendulkar bat had MRF, I want only MRF bat, isn't it? Right, so that brand wanted a certain individual to carry their name, and uh, and all of us have been given this immense honor of carrying the name of Jesus. Uh, are we carrying it proudly? Right? Or are we using it for all the right reasons? <laughs> right? Okay, you're all with me? Alive? Right. Cool. Let's move on. Um, then the second sacrament that is uh, practiced. <laughs> the Lord's table. The Lord's table was instituted by Jesus Himself. Let's go to Matthew 26, 18 to 30. Matthew 26, 18 to 30. Um, Eighteen to thirty. Eighteen to thirty. Yes. So, so when you go into the city, he told them, "You will see a certain man. Tell him the teacher says my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house." So the disciples said, "Did as Jesus uh, told them and prepared the Passover meal there." When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I will tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has just eaten from the from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scripture declared long ago. But how terrible it is. It will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for the man if he had never been born judas the one who who would betray him also asked rabbi am i the one 
and Jesus told him, You have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and grape and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Yeah, thank you. Let's read uh, another scripture. Let's, um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 34. Let's Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not both sides. For eating, each one takes food and does not help others in one place. But we do not have house to keep the need of the people's Christ for the Lord and shame those who have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive, receive from the Lord that word and also from the Lord. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, Take it. This is my body, which is broken. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, thank the Lord, said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup the Lord in an unholy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let him man examine himself and let the soul let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unholy manner eats and drinks judgment of himself, not as when he knows God. This will be the means of many a week and sick among the innocent. For if we who judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. That we may not be condemned. Then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another, for if anyone is hungry, let him eat. Let him come together to eat. And the verse tells us that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so the uh, okay, let's read one more passage of scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 21. Someone read that, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 16 to 21. The cup of blessing which we bless, it is not the com communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? For we, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake, partake of that one bread. Observe Israel, after the, after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. What am I saying then? That... An idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Thank you. <clears throat> right, uh, three very important passages when it comes to when it comes up about talking about the the Lord's table, right? From Matthew twenty six to First Corinthians chapter ten and uh, chapter eleven. Okay, um, we which is what is commonly used when we you know pass the bread and 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 the cup. Uh, it's used either from Matthew twenty six or from First Corinthians, right? You would have heard. Um, now this is not the first time. At least Matthew twenty six is not the first time he's actually talking about, uh, you know, the bread. That means he's performing that, but uh, Jesus is one of the most unpopular uh, sermons was in John chapter six, where he says, uh, you know, those eat my body and, and uh, you know, drink my blood. 
and I was like, "What did you just say?" <laughs> you know. Uh, and so a lot of people left. Uh, it, you know, it became a controversial sermon, so to say, and everybody left. And then uh, it, it's a wonderful chapter. You should read that John chapter six. And uh, towards the very end, he turns to his disciples and say, "Okay, uh, are you also going to leave me?" Uh, Peter has this classic uh, response. He says, "Where will we go? With you are the words of eternal life." Oh my gosh! I mean, Peter he surprises you sometimes with the things that he says. It's like, yeah. dude, you know, he is just, uh, yeah. And and so you you see, he kind of begins there. He's been saying that he is the bread of life. He's the bread of life. He's the bread of life. And then he talks about partaking, uh, right? And then it finally happens in Matthew 26. Passing over, again, I think we discussed about this in the last class. Passover is, we see that in, in, in the land of Egypt, before they left Egypt, uh, Exodus, is that the angel of death was passing over, right? Every house that had the blood of the lamb that was posted, right? Okay. So celebrating the Lord, the Lord's table is what? is an expression of our personal faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, so if baptism was partaking, uh, coming into the act of obedience with, uh, with God's uh, death, burial, and resurrection, the Lord's table is an expression of our personal faith. Okay, now here's the thing. What we need to remember is that we all need an encounter with God for us to start a relationship with God. Okay, say that again. We all need an encounter with God for us to start a relationship with God. Now, we all believe in Jesus Christ because somewhere, somehow, uh, you know, it, uh, we, you've encountered. It could be, uh, and now again, encounter does not only mean heavens opened up and you or something came down and all of that. No, it's you encountered his love. You encountered his faithfulness. You encountered his mercy. You, are you with me? Right. And so because of that, your journey with him started. And then you decided to get baptized, etc. So encounters are like seeds, right? Now, a seed was are seeds meant to be seeds or remain seeds? The design of the seeds is that it it would eventually grow and bear fruit, isn't it? And so our encounters are fueled uh, by faith, like you know, as we walk, as we read through the word, as we have a prayerful life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like water to the seeds. And they grow, and one of which expression is the Lord's table, right? So, an expression of a personal faith is in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. Second, a proclamation of the completed work of Christ on the cross. A proclamation of the completed work of the cross on the cross. So, when you partake, you are saying, "Okay, it is finished." I am saying, "Amen" to what is what is already done. It's powerful. Is such a powerful word. Now, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, uh, Genesis chapter 4, at the very end, verse 25, uh, oh boy, I forget. I know where it is in my Bible, but. Um, yeah, okay. So, Genesis chapter 4, it, it says, um, <clears throat> verse 25, 26. Uh, it, this, these verses might seem like it's not even related, okay? But just bear with me, trust me. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. And for she uh, said, God is appointed, right? For me, another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of sermon in there in that verse. So, verse 26, last one, it says, To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, time people be people began to call on the name of the lord or another version translation says at that time people began to proclaim the name of the lord so this one is the one of the very earliest acts of uh, worship like declarative worship okay so again proclamation or declaration cannot be done something silently we we've learned about the seven hebrew words for praise right and they are all based on your posture it's like from the lifting hands to shouting and dancing and jumping, playing an instrument, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, partaking of the Lord's table is a proclamation of that. It's uh, it's something to be celebrated. 
Okay. Uh, and thirdly, it's an expression of our faith in his return. Uh, an expression of our union with Jesus. We are declaring our communion with the body and the blood of Jesus, with Christ himself. And finally, an expression of our union with one another. Now, we are one body. We are a church, isn't it? Of his. So uh, all of this is happening when we partake of the Lord's table. Um, and so how do we prepare our hearts, examine our lives, and renouncing known sin, taking the elements, understanding and believing in what they represent, the finished work of the cross on a uh, finished work of Christ on the cross through his death and resurrection. Um, I remember, you know, there are certain things in life when certain people of God lead a certain thing and then you'll never forget it. And one of the things is I remember this person from the United States, uh, it was 2005 or something. Uh, we were having an all night prayer and, uh, and this person was leading communion and, uh, uh, this is a very small thing. Is, you know, he said, uh, and he was not even forcing anyone. He said he took a wafer and he he said, you know, when I take this, I like to break it because it reminds me that his body was broken, and and it's never left me. Like it's twenty years later or something. You know, I if I pick a wafer and I break it because I want to be reminded of what was done. What. You know, and so I, I like that. I'm sure each of us have something that we relate to. Uh, and so I'm just saying, so take the elements of understanding. Understanding of what it signifies. Uh, it, it's, it's a very holy thing, isn't it? Um, and, and that's why Paul kind of rebukes the Corinthian church. Um, is partake of this in a worthy manner. Because the Corinthians church, what they were doing is um, two things that they were that they were not preparing themselves to is one, they were partaking of the Lord's table and also partaking of the food that was offered to the idols as well, right? It's just one thing. So now it it, it had nothing to do with the food. It had nothing to do with the food, but it was what it represented because again, the Corinthians church is so deep and rich in the Roman and the Greek culture, very deep and very rich and very paganistic, I should say. Uh, right in in the culture of Roman Greek Roman era, that as we, as we as we would call it, right, uh, and so idolatry was huge. Uh, in Acts, somewhere we see that when uh, Paul comes to Athens for the first time, it says, "I'm troubled by the statues that I see, or by the idols that I see in the city." He says that. Now, idol in itself has no power, just like a lie in itself has no power. A lie gets powerful only when it comes in agreement. So if some a lie has been spoken over me, it has no power over me until and I come unless I come in agreement and say yes. Are you with me? Right? If someone says you're an absolute worthless, useless fellow. Right? You're a sinner, you're an addict, you're an etc. etc. But in within me I know that I've given my life to Jesus and I'm a new creation. So I have a choice to believe that it's an absolute lie because it's a lie. It is a lie. Or I can succumb to the pressure and say, I think I am a failure. And so you are empowering the lie. When you empower the lie, you are empowering the liar. Who's the liar? Father of lies, exactly. Right, so you get the point, right? So it's it was really not about the food when Paul was saying that; uh, it was about what was to what it was being offered and what that meant. That means they were coming in agreement with those idols that they were worshiping. Uh, you know, this classic statement we say that you become like the one you worship. Right? How can you do this, and how can you also partake of something that is so holy? Don't you have an understanding of what this means and what this signifies? And the second thing, what the Corinthians church were doing was they it, it, they treated the Lord's table as, uh, in a modern day context, uh, what do we say? What is that? Everybody brings food. What do they call it? Potluck. It's like a feast, like you know, buffet. It, it, it was treated like you know, like every okay, come, let's party and uh, in an, in an in an irre uh, not irrelevant uh, irreverential attitude. 
that means there was no honor, that there was no reverence to the Lord's table. And that's why Paul writes everything that he writes. Because you partake of the Lord's table in, in, in an unworthy manner, there are those among you who are still not well, and et cetera, et cetera. Are you with me? And so one of the points, it says how we prepare ourselves, examine our lives and renouncing known sin. One of the most audacious prayer in the Bible uh, is uh, from Psalm 139. It says, search me and know me. Right? And see if there's any wicked ways in me. And lead me in the path everlasting. Right? It's the most boldest prayer. I, I, I'm, there are a lot of prayers, but it says, you're going before God, and you are you want to make yourself vulnerable enough. Examine yourself. If I examine myself, I will choose to ignore some of the good things or bad things. You with me, right? You go before him and say, search me. You search me because you know me. And then see if there's any wicked ways in me. Right? Uh, and so... Partaking of the Lord's table is is it's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's it's holy, it's set apart, uh, right? Uh, and um, yeah, cool. We'll take a break and we'll come back and continue with one more lesson. <laughs>